morning, and thank you for joining us on another episode of the Roundtable Talk Show. I am your host, Sharifa Hardy, and I have an amazing show for you today. We have a group of interesting guests who are not only going to educate you, but entertain you as well. So I'm going to ask you to do what I always ask you to do, and that's to go ahead and share this show, because friends don't let friends miss out on the Roundtable Talk Show. So I want to go ahead and introduce you to our first guest, Mr. Eric Reed. Eric is a coach, speaker, and he's also a catalyst of change. Good morning, Eric. How are you? Good morning, and thank you for inviting me. You are welcome. Thank you for accepting the invite. You're smiling. You're ready to go today. For some reason, though, you have the scared look on your face like you're in court, like, well, what is she going to hit me with? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't know. I, I'm excited about the format. And we were chatting pre-show and you've got some amazing people. Yes. And you are one of them. So tell us exactly what you, what you do. Tell us what is a catalyst for change? Yeah. I've always tried to figure out what my thing was. Like mm -hmm. we're all supposed to bring something to the dinner party. Mm -hmm. And I don't cook well, but what I do bring is that shift. Often I'll ask a question, have a perspective, or mm -hmm. dig in in such a way that somebody's like, I've never thought of it that way. And I'm like, well, what would happen if you did? And I think that's where, when I say I come in, it's that idea that I'm not necessarily throughout the process. I create the change. I begin to move people in that direction of transformation and growth. Now, that's interesting. Often people find that they can do that in their personal lives, that they can help their friends, they can help their family. They, they do bring a new view to the party. Because to me, you look like a lot of fun. So I, if I'm having a party and Eric shows up, I'm like, oh, Eric's here. This is going to be a great party. But how did you take that from just being this wonderful, great guy to be a, an actual business? I think in part because everybody can ask a question, but sometimes it's just up here on the surface. Mm -hmm. The one that really creates the transformation is often that second or third question, like, but what about, or how could we, or that question that begins to move us from imagination, creativity, like, oh, that's a cool idea into action. Mm -hmm. And then what are the actions that once we start, we'll either feel resistance or flow mm -hmm. because flow is easy. The resistance most entrepreneurs experience is where they back out and they're like, okay, it was a bad idea. I should have never done it. I'm like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Three minutes ago, we thought it was a wonderful idea. Now that we're having some resistance, mm -hmm. why is the idea state? You no, know, the process is what's screwing us up. Let's work on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love the use of the word we. We thought it was a good idea. So this is something that you worked through, agreed upon, and then like you said, there's some resistance. What do you find is typically the resistance or the first resistance that entrepreneurs receive and kind of say, I don't know if this is for me? I, I think it's, you know, we always talk about the fear of success or the fear of failure. Mm -hmm. I think both of them really equate to the fear of change. Mm -hmm. And so that change that we might be experiencing can cause a spouse to go, uh-uh, because if you change, then I got to change and I'm not ready to change. I just got comfortable or a team or an industry or a market that we're into or even ourselves. It's like if I change and I actually begin to live this thing that I've been talking about for so long and it comes to be what I really wanted. Oh my gosh, what is my life all have been about? How much time? And we start to punish ourselves for not doing it sooner. Mm -hmm. So that shift to change, and I often have to coach and guide people like, there's going to be a lot of change going on. Are you ready for it? Let's talk about what that change will look like, feel like, be like, and how do we navigate it? Mm, interesting. We're going to talk a little bit more about navigating it. But I want to go ahead and introduce you to our next guest. I met this amazing lady on one of my past shows. We learned so much. We were entertained. Her stories about her children will have you literally laughing on the floor. But she also helps people, helps entrepreneurs make sales from speaking without 
pitch slapping the audience. Let's introduce Sue Henry. Good morning, Sue. How are you? Well, I am great, and I'm so excited to be back. It was you were such a warm, personable host. It was just a blast to be here, it, and so I was so excited to come back. Thank you. We are we're excited to have you back. Pitch slapping, Sue. What is pitch slapping? You know those messages probably you're getting a bunch of on social media right now that say, "Hi, how are you? Do you want to look at this? Do you want to buy this? Do you, you know, you'd be really good at that." It's mm -hmm. it's where people instead of trying to get to know you and figure out who you are, the only reason they're reaching out is because they want you to buy or buy something from them or join mm -hmm. their team or whatever. And it's it's false, it's fake, and I can't think that selling that way would be very much fun or very successful but what i try to do is i teach people to use stories instead and to speak and whether you're doing facebook lives whether you're doing podcasts summits i mean wherever it is you're speaking how do you use those stories in a way to compel and link arms with the audience so that they go with you because their your message resonates and all of a sudden you're not just showing them the pain that they have and showing them a solution you're showing them what their life could look like in the happily ever after. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those people that believe that there has to be a happy medium between not discussing your business at all and pitch slack. Like there's a happy medium because, you know, people come to me as a business consultant all the time. They're, they tell me, Sharifa, you know, I, I built my website. I have my social media platform, but I haven't made any sales. And I'm like, okay, well, let me take a look. Let me review it. And I go, especially to their social media and there's nothing, no offer. There's, you don't even know they're in business aside from, you know, their business name, but there aren't any posts that, you know, there's nothing. Um, but then when someone sends you a friend request, you say, okay, I'll accept this friend request. And immediately, like, Five seconds later, after you hit the accept button, they're in your inbox. Like, hey, Sue, you want to buy my POS? I'm like, I don't even know you. Like, I don't you want to watch my video? Yeah. <laughs> so you, how do you help people find a happy medium, though? I think I think there's there's three different methods. So so there's you you kind of have to know your audience first, know who you're looking for. Not all friend requests are created equal. Not all audiences are created equal. So find the the most likely group that's going to resonate with your message. Know who you serve. Then the second thing is to create stories and and build that relationship. Get to know them and have it be an honest interaction, not just oh I got to sell my stuff. Because you're going to meet some amazing people that way. And then third, you know, the third step then would be is as you're, I call it my, um, my lead seed feed. So you're leading them in and asking questions and getting to know them from a personal point of view. Then you're seeding a little bit about what you do. You know, right now I'd be saying, how are you handling it with the coronavirus? You know, what's well, you know, my business, my online business is really good, but unfortunately our milker is in ICU. So I have this new career change where I'm milking cows once a day, you know, and you just kind of keep it light. Then oftentimes they come back and they'll say, okay, what was your business? So now that they're, you know, now you've seeded that a little bit, then if they ask a little bit more information, then you can feed them a little more and then continue to see if they're interested. But it's not about just going out there and, hey, do this, do that. And not everybody wants to be a speaker. Not everybody wants to be on podcasts and that's okay, but it's important that you ferret out who is your ideal client and, and where they hang out and who isn't. Sue said my milker. I was lost at my milker. <laughs> what is a milker? Like, is that their full-time job? That's all they do for 40 hours is just milk. No, 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 no. We don't have that many cows. No, no, no. No, it was, it's, it's a, it's a part-time gig and it's, you know, three and a half hours a day because um, we are organic grass only. We only milk once a day. But um, he and some of his, they went to a party and um, everybody got sick and he's the sickest. He's in the ICU right now. And I'm it's sorry. Really scary. Pardon? No, I said, I'm sorry. I just kind of noticed when you said my milker was sick. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not who milks our cows for. So, you know, I've always had this philosophy of good wife would learn how to milk cows, but a smart wife knows better. So even though I am down there, I'm making sure that I'm not competent in too many of the areas. <laughs> I don't know if you're supposed to be doing that, Sue. We're going to speak to our next guest and find out about the good, the bad. Are you supposed to be coming up with these little stories about not being competent? Well, we know you know how to milk, Sue. But I want to go ahead and introduce our next guest, Dr. Kevin Corsini. He is president of San Diego Christian College. Good morning, Dr. Corsini. How are you? Good morning. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. You are welcome. It's a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you so much. And I was going back to one of the first questions you asked as far as a catalyst to change. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that myself. And, you know, it seems as though, uh, as I think about my own experience, catalyst to change often occurs by need. Mm -hmm. uh, and that need can be external or it can be internal. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, uh, particularly for a business owner, that need is uh, something internally. They realize, hey, my customer or the public or the people I rub shoulders with, they need this and they don't even realize it. Mm -hmm. uh, other times it's external, right? Right now we're in the middle of COVID-19 and there's all sorts of external needs that are buffeting us right now. And then we get into a reactive mode. I think as leaders, you know, the, the goal and the challenge we have is how do we get out of a reactive mode and jump into a proactive one and start engaging other people uh, in a way that, that fosters transition, right? That fosters uh, a change in a positive way. So when I think uh, of need and change, I guess in my mind, it's, it's trying to, to get those internal needs realized prior to them uh, being realized externally, right? And just getting into a reactive mode. So I'm excited about today and the opportunity to have a discussion back and forth, hear from others as well, and, and learn as much as I share. That's what I do. That's why I show up every morning simply so I can learn. But it was interesting when you speak of being a catalyst of change, you speak about internal versus external. And one of the things that we've seen is colleges and campuses being forced through necessity to do everything 100% online. I believe, aside from like ch um, just churches in general, that's one of the industries that, that did like a full pivot, a full shift, um, because many, many colleges and schools, you know, you went into the campus. That's, that's simply what you did. Have you found that to be true? Yeah, I think, you know, for us, uh, we, we were right on the, the cusp of that being in San Diego and California. We were one of the first states to be put in a position where we had to react. Mm -hmm. uh, we put in a plan uh, before we were forced to, to allow students to choose, hey, do you want to learn in the classroom or do you want to dial in and have a virtual environment where you could learn from the classroom? We had faculty broadcasting uh, live from the classroom. So some students showed up to class, others dialed in from home. And it was just a matter of days when the governor spoke up and said, hey, we're, we're going to shut down uh, all the classrooms. Mm -hmm. Most of the schools, uh, most of the colleges and universities in our area went to strict online. They just said, hey, we've got online programs. We're going to move all the students into an online environment. Mm -hmm. We are a smaller school and we were already uh, providing virtual classes. So we just continued with that. We said, hey, listen, we want we, we think our students don't just need a, an education. They don't just need their grades. They need structure, they need interaction, right? They need a live engagement in order to learn. So instead of just going to online, online you know, typically means asynchronous. I can dial in, I can download a YouTube video, I can upload my assignments, I do it whenever I want. And while that's convenient, we really didn't think that's what our students needed. So we maintained the virtual live environment for our classes through the remainder of the semester. So if you had a nine o'clock class, I guess what, you still have a nine o'clock class. You gotta dial in. And it's this type of environment. It was a live environment uh, using uh, a virtual video feed. We had to move all of our professors into a home environment. And, and like you referenced earlier in our conversation, uh, some of them didn't have really good Wi-Fi. We had to upgrade that, upgrade resources. But what we found is that by making an investment early on and pivoting to a, maybe a different delivery system, it worked better for our students. We actually saw attendance in our classes go up. Attendance in our classes was better uh, in a virtual environment than had been on, on campus. Uh, students responded really well. Now, what we did find, though, is our faculty had to change the way they delivered classes because mm -hmm. in this sort of environment, you got 30 students in a, in a sort of a Zoom feed. They're hesitant to speak up. Mm -hmm. But the chat, the chat thread, right, that, that's available was totally active. And so students loved that. 
So what we had to do is change the way that we taught. We changed our pedagogy and said, all right, leverage the chat, leverage small groups. And so we took the technology that honestly had been sitting. We hadn't been doing a lot with it the last mm -hmm. several years, but it was, it was at our fingertips. We already had it. We had to change. We had to adapt. We had to respond to those needs. And so we maintained a live virtual format for all of our classes. We leveraged the, the feed for our students so they could type in emojis or type in questions or type in comments and got way more feedback than you would in a, a traditional classroom, right? Uh, can't have 30 people all speak at once, but you can have 20 or 30 people chat all at one time. So you almost have two different threads of communication going on at the same time. So we were responding to internal needs and external needs. And by the time we got to the end of the semester, just a couple of weeks ago, we really come up with something good, something positive. And actually we're looking to the fall, planning to be back on campus. But I think we've discovered this sort of middle ground between online classes and live classes that really work for students. And so this is a new product for us that we're gonna launch this fall, uh, mm -hmm. the virtual modality of education for those students that maybe don't feel ready to be back on a campus, but they want mm -hmm. that standard schedule, the structure. Mm -hmm. So we're planning to launch that in the fall and I'm not come across any other schools that offer that type of modality for a college or a university education. We're excited about where it goes. Well, I'm okay. excited. Go ahead, Sue. I love that because it's, it's the first time I've heard of a school that is actually adapting in a way that makes it great for the students rather than expecting the students to figure out and adapt to them. I love that. Yeah, you know, I think for us, it's rare that a school sees their, their, their students as a customer. Uh, yeah. And that's, hey, you know, in higher ed, that's verboten. Like, you're not supposed to say that your, your student is a customer, but they're paying tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. And we have to think of them as a customer, right? And treat them that way. And I, you know, as we move in that direction as a college, families are responding well, students are responding well, they, they appreciate being thought of as a customer. And we live in a shifting and changing world and we've got to adapt to that. And for a lot of students, they want the structure, they want the live interaction, but they don't wanna to move to San Diego and face the high housing costs, right? So this gives yeah. them an in-between. It gives them an opportunity to be in a small classroom, live with other students, but they don't have to move to California if that's not the best fit to them. Or if they already are in California, they don't have to commute across town, right? We're creating a flexibility where they can either come to class or they can stay at home and go back and forth if they need, right? They can choose what's best for them. Yeah. I think you bring up a really interesting point, not only for universities and schools in general. I've got two kids, 11 and 10, one teacher was very asynchronous. Here's your lesson. Here's the video. Go look. I was not impressed. Other teacher, every day at one o'clock, let's get together. Let's have a little community time. Let's talk. Let's interact. And then let's go sit down. But I think when we look at entrepreneurs and moving towards the online business, there are so many people creating courses and online teachings and that it's the dump and go, the dump and go, the dump and go. Sign up and get it. Sign up and get it. And they wonder why their client or customer acquisition costs are so high and the retention is so low. Because as you pointed out, students want that chat box experience. They want to be able to dialogue and exchange ideas and information. And I think sometimes as online entrepreneurs, we forget that part of the journey is a social journey, whatever that looks like. Part of learning requires that community interaction. And so I think that's why you guys are going to continue to be successful is because you're like, we realize that education is not just absorbing information, but exchanging ideas and thoughts. And we're building a campus around that. And it'll be, I mean, as a revenue stream, once you elevate it, it's, it's limitless. And the cost yeah. of execution is fairly low in comparison to building another campus building. Yeah, you know, one of the words you use as far as what education is and isn't, it's not just a download of information. Now, education, you know, whether it's in the classroom or it's a business uh, informing their clients, education at the core should be transformation, right? Like what, what yes. we're attempting to do is change the trajectory of another life, change the trajectory. And it could be from not buy to buy. It could be, you know, of the way we think about something to change. As a, as a teacher, my job is to transform the trajectory of another life. Mm -hmm. And I can think of, you know, so I got a PhD, right? Spent a lot of time in school. 
And so I was good at that, right? So I spent a lot of time in school, but I can go back to my transcripts and find classes that I took. I earned an A and I don't remember the class. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the professor. I don't remember the assignments. I got an A on a transcript, but I don't remember anything about that. That did not change me. That, that is not education because that's not transformation. But I can tell you about times in my life where I had a conversation with an individual, you know, in the cafeteria or in the dorms that changed the way I saw the world, the way that I saw other people. And that, in my mind, that's education, right? True education is when we're in an environment around other people, and it could be in the classroom, it could be in the dorms, it could be in the cafeteria, but I'm in an environment that changes the way I think, changes the trajectory of my life. And I think that experience in a college or a university setting equips us for life because that's what we do each and every day, the rest of our lives, regardless of what business we're in, we're interacting with other people, right? And have the opportunity to change the trajectory of their life, the way they think, the way they see, right? Helping them get one step ahead of where they were two days ago. And ultimately that's what we're in the business, right? Colleges and universities are changing their trajectory, hopefully to lead people to a better life, a more informed life, a richer life. But at the end of the day, that's what we're in the business of, right? Changing the trajectories of lives. So from a business perspective, part of the, the cachet of certain colleges is that velvet rope. We only have this number of students, this number of admissions, this many in the nursing school. Now that the virtual world has sort of made your classroom size, in theory, limitless, what makes one college, what's going to differentiate you in the market versus a school down the street that only allowed 40 students in that engineering program every year? How right. do yeah. you maintain, and I guess in a sense, online businesses maintain that, that velvet rope, which also often leads to costs and et cetera. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that is a great question because uh, for some college and schools, it's all about the brand and the brand is exclusivity, right? I love, I love the example of the velvet rope, that if I can get in there and I can assume part of my, that brand into me, that I went to the university, uh, that I went to, right? That, that become, there, there's an inherent value because of what I get from that brand. Uh, I would say my own philosophy, though, the, the, the college I'm a part of, I'm much more of an inclusivistic thinker. I want as many lives as possible. And part of that is out of a value proposition, right? What I want to do is influence as many lives as I can. I, I want as many people in the classroom because it's not so much about the brand of, okay, I went to such and such college. <clears throat> it's about the individuals you're going to rub shoulders with. I think that there's yeah. legitimate life change that occurs when you start doing life with other people. And so from that perspective, I'm just greedy. I, I want as many people as possible in my classroom. It's like, bring them on. I'm not going to take an exclusivistic approach and just say, oh, just, you know, just this sort of people that fit in this sort of box get to be here. No, if you want to be here, we're, we're, we're going to have an outstanding group of individuals for you to rub shoulders with, to learn from and to grow with. But that's a very different approach. And, you know, for a lot of colleges and universities, they've been hesitant to change. They like the exclusive, exclusivistic approach and they've not adapted. And what we're seeing is a lot of schools right now are closing, shutting their doors. And that's for a lot of different reasons. For a lot of schools, they don't run like businesses. They don't understand how to read, you know, they don't understand cash flow. They don't understand how to read a balance sheet. And they've been run by people who don't really understand how to run businesses. Um, but for us, we look at uh, students as customers. I want as many as I can get, not just because we want to make more money at the end of the day, but because we want to influence as many lives as possible. And in my mind, that's what education is, influencing and changing other people's lives. I love that idea. When I um, was working with the university, the president said, I got to break it down for you. Nobody else is going to tell you. It's recruiting and retention. Mm -hmm. And if I can't sell you on, as an asset to either one of those two vehicles, mm -hmm. I can't use you. That was interesting because well, I'm, Dr. Corsini, how long have you been with, with how long have you been the president? Uh, I just, uh, I started this past September. So I, I'm fairly new in this role. I've been in academia for about the last 15 years, uh, but this is my first role as president. 
I can kind of tell that. That's why I asked that question. But you have that kind of, uh, what was that movie um, with the, the guy who came into the school? I got to remember it. And they called him Crazy Joe. He came in, he was. Um, I've been a crazy, I've been accused of being Crazy Joe. I'll tell you that a couple of times. I'm mad that it won't come to me. But he came in and he changed the school all around. And he just did things different. So I'm like, I know your predecessor had to be one way. You came in and you're like, nope, we're doing it this way. Let's change it this way. This is a business. We're not just here. Because I, can, you have that, even the hair screens, I'm a rebel. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Andy's like a Christian. I finally got a haircut. I have not had a haircut in like months. I finally got a haircut last week. <laughs> Were you supposed to get a haircut? Uh, I think you're telling on yourself. I finally got the clearance. I got the clearance, and so I was okay. I finally got a haircut. I need my hair done as well. Did you just seem someone who comes in and just, you know, we're we're doing this a completely different way, and I love it though, because you know, you're talking about your PhD being a president. Obviously, you have to have that, but. I would, you know, speaking of parties earlier with Eric, like if I went to a party and I saw you there and I sat next to you, the last thing that I would think is that you're the president of a, a Christian college. Like, I'm like, this is the guy who, you know, I don't know, a business owner, real estate owner, I don't know. Hey, well, college is a business, right? At the end of the day, either you're making money or you're losing money. One of the, but, the, the fundamental errors is thinking that, and we're a nonprofit, right? But a nonprofit doesn't mean at the end of the year you don't earn a profit. You, you've got right. to earn a profit at the end of the year, right? That's the way we've got to operate. And, and just from an organizational perspective, you are so right in that coming in and changing a culture. I mean, for the, the professors hearing that, hey, we're going to start teaching, treating our, our students as customers. We're just like, oh, what, who is this guy? What do you know? Talking about money. <laughs> and it put a fork in the road. Either people were going to be on board and say, hey, we're going to do things a new way or they weren't on board and they chose a different path. And I think anytime you have a leader in an organization come in and try to introduce a new culture and a new direction, you put a fork in front of each person and they have to choose, am I gonna be on board or am I not gonna be on board? And then as a leader, you know, you've gotta lead. You gotta say, hey, this is the direction we're gonna go and either you're on the team or you're not. And that, that can be difficult. And I love the fact that you're focusing on your students as the customers rather than catering to the instructors because you know because i think that's where so many you get this upper management mentality you get you know the top is so heavy that it's difficult to change it and so what gets lost are the customers the customer experience and everything like that i love how you've put that business spin on it it almost gives me goosebumps it's really exciting about the future of education that maybe my grandchildren will get to experience you know, the sad thing about education, and you mentioned earlier that I have a PhD. Uh, a PhD is a union card into higher ed. I mean, I knew that when I pursued my PhD. I didn't have any false pretensions about it. I knew I needed to get a, a doctorate. I had had a, you know, the doctorate in order to enter into this world. And there are a lot of professions that when you go, it, go through your education, that might be your bachelor's, it could be your master's, you're earning a union card, right? You're, in, you're, you're earning the right to enter into that profession, or even just the right to sit for a licensure exam. But education shouldn't just be that, right? It should be more than that. And, and we have to think of education not just being in the classroom, it's, it's what happens in the dorms or the apartments or in the cafeteria or in the student center. We have to approach education, not from the faculty, just the, hey, you're gonna learn in this class. It's no, this is gonna change who you are through every facet of what we offer as a college. And we want to be able to, to sell that to our students as well, that hey, you're going to be changed, not just by what you learn in the classroom, but by every person you encounter across this entire campus. And you're going to be better equipped once you go out into the real world because of this. You know, we, we, we emphasize the liberal arts and helping a student understand that, you know, taking a literature class really is going to prepare you for life, not because you're going to be pushed to discuss Faust at your next dinner party, but because you're going to be equipped to think. That you're going to be you're going to be presented with things throughout your life that are either difficult or challenging and man, you might not use trigonometry ever again but we're going to build those parts of your brain that are designed for critical thinking so that when you encounter something new and unfamiliar and maybe uncomfortable and unwanted you will have been challenged and stretched and you'll know how to think 
and you'll know how to problem solve and you'll be better equipped to navigate that when it arrives because the rest of your life it might not be trigonometry but you're going to be placed uh, placed in situations where there's challenges you're uncomfortable it's dislike it's hard and difficult but we want you to be ready to navigate whatever that is when it occurs. And so these sort of things help you think better when you go out of the world. So part of liberal arts education is just being a more well-rounded person, but preparing you to think critically for everything that's ahead. Okay, so what you do now, doctor, is after the show, you take this video and you edit that part to that little clip for that <laughs> skill and you add it right to the website. And then just that's, this is what you're gonna get when you come to our college, when you That's get right. to our campus, this is it. And then all of a sudden, I'm sure enrollment is going to go through the roof. That, that was a commercial right there. <laughs> right there. Well. well, and I can't think of very many parents who wouldn't, wouldn't love that philosophy and mm -hmm. be more persuasive in getting their kids to choose your college, if, you know, et cetera, you know? Well, you know, well, Sue, people, I, I think, you know, people think about college as, well, they're going to go get a job. Uh, I've got I actually have two in college right now. I, I've got a, a one who's a rising senior and one that's a sophomore. When I started thinking about it, it's, you know, what do I want my kids to get out of college? And I think today, at least I guess for myself, I, I, I think that, that we're in the business of making adults. Like we're in the business of making grownups because I don't want my kids coming back home, right? <laughs> <laughs> what is this with the kids? That's so, like college. you can't come back. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah. So what college is where you send your kids with the, as a parent, as a parent, is with the expectation of you're not going to come back. Right. You're going to get a job, right? You're going to go and you're going to get a career. But what we often don't think about is, but I also want you to be responsible. And I want you to be independent. I want you to be able to get your own place to live, whether that's an apartment or buy your first house. I want you to be able to balance a checkbook. I want you to be able to manage your own relationships. It, that college is building a grown-up. It's building an adult, right? Because oftentimes our 17, 18 year olds, you know, I don't know that they're ready to go out and be on their own, but they go for those four years, sometimes five years of college with the expectation of that's where you become an adult, that's where you launch. And for, I think it's a, it's, it's a mistake to think of a, hey, that's where you're gonna go get a job. Mm -hmm. You know, you're gonna go and you're gonna learn these skills, you're gonna become an accountant and then you can get a job. Well, just because you have those skills to get a specific job doesn't mean you're ready to be an adult and go out and learn on your own. And as a college or university, I think we have that kind of responsibility as well, because I think a lot of parents expect that to have somebody who's responsible and independent and can get a job, right. And, and be a person of character and integrity. You know, for us, we're a faith-based institution as well. So everything is seen through that lens. We want students who are ready to launch, they're equipped, they're prepared, and they can go be a positive impact. You know, for us, it's go live all the plans God has for your life. That's what we want. I think that's the job of colleges and universities. I think you bring up a lot of interesting dynamics that are going to shift very quickly. I mean, what happens to out-of-state tuition if I'm living in Georgia but attending your university all through virtual campusing? How do schools now justify those additional costs of walking on campus versus remote learning? You know, there's always been sort of a cost reduction if you went to night school or, you know, CE mm -hmm. credits because you weren't part of the real college. You were in the offshoot. Now, parents are, get, we're sitting with a fourth grader going, should we return to school next year or could we do online learning through a different institute with a different curriculum with a different learning base? You created a whole new business model as a response to COVID. But then again, is this the shift that the American education system is needed forever? Because I did, you know, I went to the University of Moorhead. Woohoo! Moorhead Farm. <laughs> <laughs> I I learned a lot about dairy farming and sugar beets. <laughs> and it was cheap. And that was what my parents were like, look, it's in state. They got to accept you because they got to give you your first year because you graduated from the school. What would be the benefit of me pursuing a higher education out of state if the cost is no longer a barrier? Yeah, well, and for private schools like ours, we, we, we don't have the benefit of in-state versus out, -state, uh, out of state. It's, it's all the same price for us. Now, our the students in the state of California, they, they do get a, a specific grant. It's called Cal Grant. 
But for us, the, the, the tuition doesn't change regarding, regarding your residence. However, we do our online tuition. So we do have asynchronous online courses is much less. It's significantly less because the overhead is, is, is so much less. I mean, the overhead is less and uh, you know, the, the net is actually much higher. And that's true of right. any college that's doing online the right way. That's where they're earning their money is online because the overhead is so low. This virtual though provides sort of an in-between because we can take a biology class being broadcast on campus. We're gonna have on campus students, right? We want residential students. But I can take that class and I can broadcast it live and I might have 25 students in the class but what if I have 500 students dialing in virtually, right? Watching it, participating live, right across the world. And then all of a sudden I have a responsibility to break those up. I don't want 250 people in a single chat room, but it's not difficult to break that up and have them in groups of 25. They're all watching the same thing live, but they're in a chat room with maybe just 20, 20 now, students with a, with a, with a moderator. Right? That that has something to do. They, the PA can now host like in Zoom, the breakout rooms right, exactly. and read them. Exactly. Okay. So it creates, it creates a new opportunity. It also creates new needs, right? And new challenges to figure out how to navigate this. But to your point, it'll be at a much, much lower price point. Eric, you brought up a very interesting point, not just about schools, but I don't know if any of you, you saw the article um, about Mark Zuckerberg. And he was saying, because they moved really to having their employees work remotely, that if they're not in the same area because it's so expensive where Facebook is, then he's going to reduce or he plans on reducing their salaries. Did anyone else see that or am I alone? I didn't, but I think it poses a great way to bring pay equity in place too, because sometimes, you know, the pay equity scale is based on your location, not your skill set, or based right. on your accessibility. And there's a lot of talented people that right now because of child and kids being at home, haven't been able to enter the workforce at the same point. I've also seen doctors, I have a therapist and she's like, for the first time, my practice is growing because I can now take clients that weren't, she's a speech therapist. How hard is it to do speech therapy face to face on a Zoom call? She's like, my clients can now travel from anywhere in the state to access me by clicking a button. And so she's created a team of virtual appointment setters. I don't know their official name, where they go on beforehand, handle the technology, make sure the kid and the parent and everybody are set, and then pass it off to the speech therapist. So she's just one after another. And her business is growing because she realized she had a larger, larger audience and was willing to go there. You know, that sort of thing also, we work with a lot of clinical mental health professionals. That's providing access, that, that type of uh, telemedicine is providing access to underserved rural communities where, you know, you talk about Facebook, it might be really expensive to live where, where their headquarters are, but hey, if I can live in Nebraska and work for Facebook, I'll take less money because it's less to live there. Mm -hmm. By the same token, Eric, your example is we've got people who have access to experts in their field, right? Talented people that might not live out in rural underserved areas that now finally have access to good health care, right? Good clinical mental health, good, good coaches that they never would have in their own communities just because they can dial into them. It's giving people better access to better relationships that lead to better change. My, my fear is that once this COVID thing clears, I don't know, I think they have a date scheduled. I haven't gotten the memo. <laughs> uh, they're gonna, they're like the whole telemedicine was sort of a response that the, the medical community will pull it back out of fear and they'll stop all of the services because we have to go back to the old way. Mm -hmm. I guess if I was doing the interview, can, What's going to stop you as a university from slipping back to the old way? Or what's going to stop the rest of us as entrepreneurs from slipping back to the old way? I, I think it's culture, right? I mean, it's the culture of an organization and comfort. I, I, I want to go back to restaurants, right? I want to go sit in a restaurant. I want to be able to go back to the beach. You don't have young children. <laughs> <laughs> college age, right? The college age. So, uh, yeah, I think there's a part of our culture that we just want to go back to what's comfortable, back to what we know. And this is this whole COVID-19 19 thing has presented an opportunity for us to adapt and change in some ways that might be better moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I think the challenge we, we face is just getting complacent. And I just want to go back to what's comfortable versus, you know, there were some really good things that came out of that, mm -hmm. that I think I need to keep up with. I, the community I'm in, I'm seeing people take walks. 
I mean, there are more people out walking and on runs in groups, like, you know, mm -hmm. in families. All of a sudden you see moms and dads out taking a walk with their kids like you never did before. There's some of that that's really good that I hope we hold on to. I hope we don't just slip back into what was comfortable. I think we hold, my hope is that we'll hold on to those things that, that are better now, that we've learned and grown because of this. It's challenged us, right? Catalyst for change. We've been mm -hmm. faced with a need and some of that should stick with us, I hope. Yes, uh, what, that's one of the, I love the interview question, Eric. <laughs> you, you are doing the interview. <laughs> but that's one of the questions that I that I ask often, like to my guests, is you're doing this now. Do you feel that you'll go back to the way things were or doing it the old way? And most people, because they were forced to do it this way, it's like they were forced, but they're like, ah, oh, I never knew. You know, um, one example I give is my mom works for a large corporation. They have two huge buildings in downtown Los Angeles. And if anybody knows downtown Los Angeles and real estate, it is not like Fargo, okay? The costs are <laughs> not the same. No Fargo bashing, I'm just saying. But they put out a memo um, recently that they're most likely gonna allow whoever wants to work from home moving forward to continue to work from home. And so when you have two offices and now at least maybe half of your staff wants to work remotely, you're like, yes, because you can consolidate everyone basically who wants to be there, who is essential. That's like, that's the new word. Like you're essential. You're more important than everybody else. So <laughs> they can add them to, you know, to one building and lower their overhead, lower their costs. I've spoken with attorneys who said, you know what? I, I realized I really didn't need an office. I was going to the office with the suit to give the impression of, you know, I'm the lawyer. I'm, that's who I am but they've been doing everything remotely and have really enjoyed making that transition. I think I've seen a really interesting trend. So when we all jumped online, we all showed up like we were at the office and we had our <laughs> green screens and yes. everything was like manicured. And then everybody sort of was like showing up in their pajamas and their potato outfits, <laughs> you know? And I think there needs to be, I, at least in my industry, I've been really educating people that you still have to appear professional. Though you are not in an office, you still need to appear as if you showed up with an intention. Mm -hmm. you, know, you need to manicure the look to present the right image to what you do and what you say. And so often I'll get on lives like this and it's like, do you realize what's like hanging over your shoulder or what the distraction is or how you sound or what you look like? Because we only have this, what, two inch screen to present ourselves in, we've got to be really good as teachers. I'm sure you're giving a lot of instructions to the online. We've got to get really good and tight and we can't fling it and wing it and go online because everybody's going online and expect our business to maintain and grow. Yeah, yeah absolutely. What are your thoughts we on that, Sue? I think it's going to be interesting to see the transition. I think that, you know, like Eric was saying, there is a happy medium between coming in your pajamas and putting on the suit and tie. But it's so, you know, you need to look presentable. You need to kind of look the part a little bit, but it's also in your posturing. Mm -hmm. As far as as far as how you show up, you know, if I'm in my pajamas, because I only put my pajamas on when I'm going to relax and go to sleep. If I'm online in my pajamas, that posturing is going to be different than if like this morning when I came in from the barn, I, you know, took the shower and everything like that and um, cursed again because we still can't, our salons aren't open. I can't get my hair done. But, but, I know you know, you're paying. Yeah, but, but I mean, it's, it's, it's an about the posturing and clothes, although they maybe seem superficial, they still help us to create that posture and some of us don't know how to get the green screen to work right so we look all weird so that's why you see the stuff in the background <laughs> well and i've been doing a lot of teaching and training as part of that whole creating your online image your online brand your online voice your story because i have a green screen because of the bandwidth and things going on i was struggling to maintain a quality green screen i was like if you can't do it well, don't do it. I didn't say perfect. Well, uh -huh. so, you know, I opted for something different that's a little more neutral. And I'm, but again, as I said, I see so many people 
that will just jump online and start rambling and just throwing it out. And it's like, no, you've got, you only have this much screen and you're not really getting the feedback that you think you're getting. So you got to be really good at what you're doing or you're going to blow your business right out of the box because everybody is showing up online. Yeah, intention is important. You have to have your message be intentional when you show up and understand what you want people to do at the end of it. And that doesn't always mean you want to make a sale, but what is the purpose, what value we're giving? And then at the end, what is it you want people to do? What's your call to action? Yeah, and yeah, that's also your question. No pitch slapping. From the moment <laughs> I saw that, I was like, I know who she is and what her message is about building relationships before yeah. building pocket. Well, we found that attention, you said intention. Uh, I was thinking att attention spans are different in this environment as well. You know, in a live environment, you might get a, a 30, 45 minute monologue. Uh, but in a virtual environment, that does not work. You got about five, 10 minutes and you got to give people the opportunity to interact and respond. Mm -hmm. And I tell my clients that same thing. Unless I know coming in that this is a one hour lecture and I'm sitting in my lecture chair with my, you know, like, don't give it to them as a one hour unless they know walking in the door because you're in a from 90% of us, we're interrupting their day. We're kind of coming in between this and that, and we may be on the front seat of the car. They're not there to be talked at like they would in a lecture hall or in a classroom. Yeah, and even when they expect it in a, in a lecture hall, they don't want it. I mean, after about 15, <laughs> 20, 20, 25 minutes, they're zoning out because you're not mm -hmm. live in a classroom. There's too many distractions. So you have to adapt. I'm sure in business, it's the same sort of way, having to adapt because this is not like what it would normally be in a, in a live environment, right? Face to face. How were you able to get the professors to adapt? We, uh, well, so we've been meeting on a regular basis and we, we created essentially two teams, one to look at technology and one to look at pedagogy, the way the teaching goes. And that most of that's faculty. And as we're learning by mistakes, I mean, and giving faculty permission to blow it and make mistakes, I think, or, or just anybody on the team uh, yeah. and just, okay, this is what we're seeing with students. And so there's a, a feedback loop that we've got each week of, okay, here's what we're seeing. All my students are doing that. Are you? Oh yeah, they're, they're there, but then they zone out. Okay, well, how can we adapt? So we're using that feedback loop to adapt and change week by week. Um, I don't think we did it right uh, out of the gate. I think we improved <laughs> and got better and better. As we look to the fall, I think we're in much better shape, but we had to kind of watch the students, watch how that customer reacted to this new mm -hmm. environment, and then allow their behaviors to adapt the way we delivered instruction. Uh, so one was going to smaller, uh, small uh, discussion groups. Mm -hmm. So teach a little bit, break up into groups of four or five where they can discuss, come back, teach, go back to small groups. And then leveraging the chat function was a big one that we learned from pretty quick. But it wasn't just adapting one time, it was every week adapting and every week adapting and watching how students change their behavior. And I think that's true of any business, right? As mm -hmm. we're forced into a new environment, we have to adapt, we have to adapt, we have to adapt and watch how is it that our customers are responding given this, this new climate or this new environment. One of the things so that I found interesting was my aunt, her granddaughter, she's like 14. And her school, and I was, I was telling, I was sharing the story on one of my shows, they emailed them PDFs of their assignments. And so each week, the PDF was approximately 90 pages. So my aunt contacted me and she's just like, well, what do we do? I'm going to take it to Kinko's and print it out. And, and so I said, okay, you do understand that this is a 90 page PDF and that there are three weeks with 90 pages per week at about 75 cents per page. This is gonna be kind of expensive. You do realize that. She was like, no, I had no idea. They just said, go print it. So I'm telling this story on, you know, on a round table talk show. And one of my guests said, she said, well, at least she received a package. She said at my school, uh, they just told the parents, go home and teach them something. I said, what does that mean? She said, that's what they said. They said, go teach them something. I'm like, so she's at home, like, uh, you want to learn podcasting? You know, so <laughs> interesting, the response. And then there were other people who were like, okay, the students were sent home. The students don't even have laptops. They don't even have internet. Like, what are they supposed to do? So I've seen a wide array or a wide response 
or, or you know, from schools on how they're going to provide education. And yeah, I think I was going to say, I think that's where Kevin gets it right and my school got it wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm the client. Mm -hmm. I'm the customer. As the parent, granted you're teaching to my child, but everything has to come through me, so to speak. He's a fourth grader and I have a special ed in fourth as well. And so it was requiring my time mm -hmm. to sit in the teacher chair, the navigator chair, the conductor chair. And it was like, download the PDF, bring it over to Google Doc, fill it out and up. And I was like, dude, I work on a, on a, on a Mac. I don't know this Google Chrome crap. <laughs> and we ended up so frustrated navigating the teaching environment that we were responsible for that I was like, look, I'll teach you about the Civil War. They lost, we won, move on. <laughs> <laughs> like if you tell me what the value of the lesson is then I can teach towards that but just to navigate and I think a lot of the teachers took this as an extended snow day mm -hmm. that you know what when this all goes back to normal we won't have to adapt we won't have to know anything we'll just go back mm -hmm. and it for us we started March 13th and we just ended last week mm -hmm. my kids grades never looked better mm -hmm. <laughs> Look, Eric, you, you, hey, I applaud you because my, my kids are 23 and 26. So I tell them if my kids were small during this time frame, I just have to take them back to school and apologize. Like, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know. I, they asked me a question. They asked me about the Civil War. And I, I was like, I know it started sometime around the beginning. I can tell and you. Then, and then yeah. it ended eventually, you know, like, don't ask me <laughs> details and specifics because I don't know. I don't, I'm not the parent to teach, believe me. But it was so funny because I was giving feedback to the teachers. I'm like, if you'd like, I have a Zoom account that can hold 500 people. If you want to bring the classroom in, I'll let them, and then we'll set up breakout rooms that they can go in and do project-based. Like, lady, I can do the technology. Mm -hmm. And they weren't willing to adapt. They had to follow the rule, follow the protocol, follow the system. And it's just like you're... You don't understand, and I know education. If I choose to remove my kid and go online, you lose dollars because yes. for every butt in seat, that's a dollar, and every dollar equates to a teacher, and every teacher equates. And so you might want to think about how you're get. There's been no attempt to set up for next year, mm -hmm. and I already know parents that say even if they open school, we're not going back. Mm -hmm. We're just, we're not ready to go back. We're not comfortable going back because here in Georgia, we start like late August, even if they push it till September. Mm -hmm. A lot of parents are saying, we're not sending our kid back. Mm -hmm. And if what they ended the year with is what they're going to start with the year is, we'll find something else, mm -hmm. which directly impacts school dollars. And school dollars not going to schools lower school scores, which lower property taxes, which, you know, there's this huge cycle for every parent that pulls out. And so, yeah. Dr. Kevin, I need you to come to Gwinnett County. <laughs> <laughs> um, He's in California with me, he all right. Long community-based online learning system. Yeah. I so spent a lot of time time. in Cobb County, so I'm familiar with where you are. All right, good. Yes, go ahead and show them how it's done. And now one of the things, because I love to research or at least have research because I, I get little bits and pieces of information and then I'm like, you heard about this? But I read the other day in the Cal State, they're going to stop using the SAT scores. It, you saw that, Dr. Kevin? Yeah, yeah, saw that as well. And for this next year, we're going to move away. I mean, th th those are the schools in our environment, right, where we are in California. So we're not going to use SAT and ACT scores moving ahead as well. Um, you know, people have different feelings about that. Uh, I think just as we look at our, our culture and our society, there's a lot of things that are going to have to change moving forward. That's just one. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some colleges, universities out there that are going to hold on to that until the last dying day, right? That that is their, that one card they're going to hold on to. That are others, you know, and I think we're one that we're going to take a hard look at whether we need that moving forward or not. Uh, we want to find students Again, I think that's part of the, the velvet rope. You know, here's one other way that we can keep you out. We want students who want to learn. We want students who, who want to grow. And uh, putting a score, putting a number on a student, usually that's not a good way to do that. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we want to find students that are going to be a good fit for our environment. And so you want to look at the whole student. Um, but I, I think as you look across industries and businesses, we're all happy to adapt regardless of what business you're in. And looking ahead, I think we have to hold things loosely and say, you know, it might look different in the coming years. SAT and SAT, just, that's just one example of ways industries are going to have to change. I think you point out something all entrepreneurs need to be aware of, though, is letting go of that ego, because that's yeah. what puts up that velvet rope. Like, you know, if you're creating an online business, you got to be ready to take some serious feedback mm -hmm. and adapt quickly. And that sometimes as entrepreneurs sounds really personal, but you don't understand this is my pet project or this is my, my baby of course. Mm -hmm. And people are like, I ain't getting it. It's not resonating. It's dull with me. Mm -hmm. People, I think because of COVID and I think because of the online access to people that they never had before are going to be a lot more vocal about not good enough moving on. Mm -hmm. I'm not restricted by price and I'm not restricted by location as much as I used to be. Mm -hmm. So I don't need you. I mean, I need but, the information, but I don't mm -hmm. need you if you can't meet me. But I think right. another thing, I think that's an excellent point, Eric, but to just add on that and just put a little bit more sugar on the top is that they're not restricted by time. One of the things that they've seen before is that prior to COVID-19, people spent approximately two hours on Facebook or, or social media or online. As a result, now they're, they're spending approximately eight hours. So when, you, when typically you would say eight hour day, you knew it was work. They were referring to my job. No, now their job is to be online, to research, to, 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 to go through Netflix and watch everything all day. So they have more time to evaluate what it is that they want. They're not like, oh, let me grab this because I got to run off to work. Let me go, you know, I, no, they're at home. They're arrested. They, they haven't gone anywhere. So they, will, they have the time and the luxury of evaluating what they feel is best for them and their families and families have been more of a focus than ever before. Now we are coming down to the end of the show. And what I love to do at the end of every show is just simply allow my guests to speak directly to the audience, to everyone who's watching live, as well as everyone who's watching this show in the archives and really let them know what you want them to take away from your appearance. So for once in my life, I'm gonna utilize the ladies first and give the floor to you, Sue. Thanks. I think you know, this was a really interesting conversation and everything that Eric and Kevin were talking about relates to business. We have been, business has been changing anyway and those business leaders who don't adapt and I'm talking entrepreneurs to on up. If we don't adapt, we're going to be dinosaurs and we're gonna be out of business. What has happened with COVID-19 is that it's condensed the, the time frame in which we need to make those changes. And it's, and it's all about, like what Eric said, we have to let the ego go and focus on serving like Kevin is talking about, so that when we serve with our heart, when we serve and our, our main concern is helping them get the transformation that is most important to them, it doesn't matter what we've created in the past because it's all about the transformation and helping that person. So we're not tied to a program, we're tied to the end result of that transformation of that person. Absolutely. That was so beautiful. Dr. Corsini. Yeah. So speaking directly to the audience, I, I would say that COVID-19 presents every single one of us with an opportunity. Now is an opportunity to change. It might be changing yourself. It might be changing the business. It might be changing the way that you do family, but there's an opportunity that each and every one of us face. And I would challenge each person to dream big. And what will it require for you to change, to take advantage of this opportunity yeah. so next year and two years and five years out, you're in a better spot than you are right now. Use this opportunity to change, to become a better version of yourself, your family, your business, your industry. Take advantage of this unique spot. Dream big and make the changes that are necessary right now. Might be going back to college, might be changing your business, but put it all on the table and be willing to dream big and make the changes that are necessary. I love it, dream big. You over there dreaming big, Eric? I'm always about dreaming big. <laughs> what do you have for us? I think it's interesting that we have an organic dairy farmer from lower Southern Minnesota, a faith-based college president, both sh sharing the same message. Mm -hmm. Be adaptable, be flexible, be in front of the wave, don't get crushed by the wave. I mean. 
how different could two individuals be but share the same reaction of like, look, we can bitch and moan about what's happening. We can complain about where the old world used to be or we can fumble and make mistakes and move in front of it because ultimately this is about transforming lives and you can't do it if you're at the back of the wave. And so if you're in this as an entrepreneur at any level to transform and create change, you got to get out in front. You got to be flexible. You got to be adaptable. You got to be listening to dairy farmers and online faith-based <laughs> universities, which I never thought I would learn anything <laughs> at school, but I finally did. Thank you, Dr. Kevin. <laughs> Do we get credit though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can I give him? I'll just be an adjunct professor. We'll tell you that. that works. Some of us never went to college, but if I had found a college like that, maybe I would have. That's right. Yeah, but you, you don't need to go to college to learn a lot if you're milking cows every day. I'm sure you learn tons out on the farm. <laughs> well, I've, I've done a little bit more in my life than milking cows, so it's all good. <laughs> Learn, learning, I don't know. Learning, about is the, learning is about the whole life, right? Not just As about is. a classroom. Learning is all life. Amen, amen, amen. I don't know about you all, but I have enjoyed myself today. I tell everyone I love my life. I love what I do because I have the opportunity to spend time with all of you. So I want to thank you for being a guest on today's episode of the Roundtable Talk Show. I also want to thank everyone who tuned in live as well as everyone who's watching this show in the archives. And again, I invite you to go ahead and share the show, share the education, the information, the joy with your friends. That's what I really appreciate if you do that. Also, to visit the websites of our guests, there's a lot of information. Who knows? You might be in Montana and decide you want to go back to college and you can go over there and learn from Dr. Corsini. You can also, hey, maybe you want to be a farmer. <laughs> milking. I, I don't know. Maybe no, you, you don't food. want to be that. <laughs> I, I don't know. And you know, when you want to change, I'm sure Eric has that covered for you, but go ahead and visit our guests. I definitely appreciate you. If you are interested in being a guest, please visit the website at ashsharifa.com until tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Everyone have a safe and a blessed day. Bye now.